here on Breakfast this morning. And uh, we'll start with a quote for you, shall we? Uh, the best thing for you, your family and for everybody else. That's the words of the Prime Minister last night, just after he received his first coronavirus vaccine. And he's urging all of us to get the same. He got the Os Oxford AstraZeneca jab, which, of course, has been the focus of so much speculation in the UK and right across Europe this week. Yeah, but, but the rollout of the vaccine has resumed in France, Germany and Italy and other countries. Uh, although it does remain paused in some states, despite experts insisting that there's little risk of blood clots. It's been quite a confusing week, I think, hasn't it, with all sorts of claims and counterclaims. Let's try to put it all into perspective. Let's reflect and, and look forward as well. Answer some of your questions on breakfast with the help of our regular Saturday morning team, uh, virologist Dr Chris Smith and Professor of Public Health Linda Ball. Morning to both morning. of you. Hi, morning. Hi, thanks so much for joining us. I know lots of people really value uh, your sort of take on the week and should we should we just start off with that just sort of where are we now compared with with seven days ago when we last saw you Chris because it, it feels like it's well in in the words of Matt uh, Hancock been a bit of a bumpy week well yeah I mean we were a bit concerned because there was this question about supplies of the vaccine there was the negative press and neg negative sentiment about the AstraZeneca vaccine because of what was happening in Europe and then thankfully towards the end of the week there was enormous reassurance as regulatory bodies said they had investigated. They were continuing to investigate, as any good regulator should, to keep an eye on how these vaccines are performing. But we can be reassured that if there is a risk, it's a really, really, really tiny one. And the vast majority of the risk from coronavirus infection, if you catch it, can be offset by having one of those vaccines. So it is, as Boris Johnson says, the best thing to do. So Walter, right back here. I think there's two things there, Rachel. I mean, the concerns about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, I think, show that the system is working, that you can report adverse events, and of course, they need to be investigated. Um, but it's very clear from the World Health Organization and the European Medicines Agency that this still is a safe and effective vaccine. And we've heard some reports, and I know you've talked about them on the program, of people being a bit hesitant here, but not much of that filtering through, and let's hope that continues. And we learning from the rise in the number of cases and that third wave that seems to be starting uh, in Europe and you know some of some sort of doom heavy headlines and this morning's papers what do you think well, I think there's a number of factors driving that, John. So Jacqueline's asked a very good question. We are in a different position from Europe at the moment, but what the European countries are facing is a number of things. The first thing is that we've gone through quite an intensive period of restrictions. That's not uniformly the case in Europe. In fact, restrictions are now having to be introduced in places like Poland, some parts of France, and uh, Czech Republic, for example, who've had to send patients, COVID patients, to other countries. On average, it's about 8.6% of the population have had their first dose as an average. And that compares, as Chris was saying, with just under half here. So I think we, we need to watch, we need to be cautious, but we also need to recognise that countries, unlike in 2020, are not all taking the same trajectory. So things positive in the UK, but we do just have to keep a watching brief on, on the direction of travel. Yeah, and, and going back yeah. to that, that old kind of maxim that, you know, no one is safe till everyone is safe, what we'll offer protection for before a booster jab is needed. We don't know, Rachel. And the answer is that we have to actually work this out as time goes on. People are aggressively studying this. We're actually doing studies to follow up how long the immunity lasts for, because it's going to be critical to inform our booster strategy. We're a couple of years. Most people's immunity has waned, which means they become susceptible again. But unlike natural infection, when you catch one of these viruses, the vaccines do produce immunity, which is tens to hundreds, even thousands of times more powerful in terms of the immunity you get when you catch the virus. There are a number of reasons why that happens. So one could say, well, it's likely that the immunity conferred by the vaccine may actually go on to last a bit longer. We don't know yet, which is why we're doing the trials to find out. Europe and the problems with the vaccine supply here right now, is the 31st of March the right time to end shielding? I suppose the suggestion from him is maybe we should keep shielding for a bit longer. What do you say, Linda? Well, Steve, a lot of people around the country are thinking of this. In England, there are 3.7 million people shielding. And of course, more people will add it to that list in February because we looked at risk factors like age, ethnicity, area of deprivation and overweight and obesity. So there was a different uh, risk score given to some people. Um, the 31st of March, I think the key thing there is that shielding um, is voluntary. People have, need to take their own precautions on shielding is that it does vary in terms of the dates around the UK. So in Wales, 
and England, it looks like the guidance will change around the end of March, beginning of April, but up here in Scotland, not until the end of April. So it is about people to make their own choices, but recognize that people who've been shielding have been disadvantaged, they have been more isolated than others. And if we continue to make progress, and I think it's, it's proportionate for us to say, okay, um, the same kind of guidance that applies to the general population can also apply to those who... As fans, we saw the pictures the other week. Does this mean outdoor transmission is minimal? Now, that's something we've discussed time and again on this programme. It also leads us into the question about why other protests or vigils or marches weren't allowed. I don't want to draw you into the kind of political ramifications of that. But is it, with outdoor events and activities, is it all about proximity? It's all about how close you are to other people, for how long and in what sort of environment. But you can't view these things in isolation. Yes, you might go to an outdoor venue for an event and you might remain socially distanced there. And that might mean there's almost no chance whatsoever that you're going to bump into somebody who could give you something you haven't got or vice versa. But the upstream of that is how did you get to the venue? Did you share a car with another family? Did you share a train or a bus or even a plane? It's all of the travel, the contacts and the other activities that are connected, including the staff who run those venues, those other things related to that event. When we do feel much more comfortable because we've, we've loaded the seesaw so heavily on one side with protection, we can afford to take more of those risks on the other side and the seesaw will remain balanced in our favour. I suppose over the next week or so, we're going to see the figures about the impact of, of kids going back to school. It's, it, it, are they just for her to use? Should everyone in the household also be testing? If so, how often? What, what's the guidance on that? I guess, again, it depends where you live, does it? It is different in different parts of the UK. And of course, we've been, as we've discussed on this programme before, uh, grappling with the tests in our in our household um, with my daughter, who's been using them. But I, I um, in terms of what's um, advised nationally on this, so these lateral flow assay devices, lateral flow tests, are being given to pupils in school. And also, I emphasise to staff, that's not just teachers, but anybody working in or around the school. Um, but family members can also order them, or they can pick them up at a community hub. And the government... Um, if you look at the gov.uk website in particular, um, is certainly saying that um, parents, others in the household can request tests. Is, as Chris and I have discussed before, these tests are brilliant in that they're rapid, they give you a result within 30 minutes, but they're significantly less accurate than PCR testing. So if somebody tests positive, it's important that you get another test, a, a confirmatory test from the NHS great, great. before, for example. But in the meantime, do self-isolate if you can because obviously it is a prospect that that lateral flow test, of course, may be accurate. This is great. This has been sent in from Mrs Christine Brizzledon from Sidcup in, in, uh, in England and she's saying that she's been inspired to draw this picture of you, Chris, because uh, she said she wanted to show her appreciation to you and one of the many prominent people that have appeared on Breakfast who've helped us get through the last year and she really values that. I mean, isn't that lovely? That's a great picture. That is amazing. It's uncanny. Is it for sale? Will she sell it to me? Because I'll donate the proceeds to charity or I'll make a donation to charity if she'll send it to me. It's wonderful. I'll put it on the wall. And then we can have it on the, on, the, on the BBC Breakfast Saturday morning backdrop. It's great, isn't it? Maybe we could turn it into a clock in its own right. And then we could... Uh, well, yeah. That's what, yeah, yeah, we could. That could be my next clock. But I suppose the other thing, and you two have had a bit of banter every week. Um, you've, you've swapped flowers and plants and clocks. But I'm just wondering, we don't have a picture of Linda sent in yet. So I wonder for next week, maybe Chris could give us a picture of Linda. You could draw a picture of Linda for us. No, my He's probably not skills interested. are really not very good. You don't want to do that. <laughs> that, that. That makes me want it even more, Chris. That would be very unfair on Linda. I'm not kidding. It really would be very unfair on Linda. Other volunteers are needed, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the call has gone out, Linda. The call has gone out. Thank you both uh, for joining us once again. It's always brilliant to have you on on a Saturday morning. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, Dr Chris Smith and Professor Linda Bald. And thank you, here. Christine, for the picture. It's brilliant. Yeah.